Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you for the invitation to this wonderful event. It's um, a real honor to be here. Um, theoretical epidemiology does indeed <laughs> translate into a love, a passion for infectious diseases. And <laughs> so um, the question that I'm going to throw out to you, perhaps a little too creatively, is what do infectious disease agents have in their wardrobes? Hopefully, by the end of the 10 minutes, you'll understand why I'm using such a frivolous analogy. So infectious diseases are caused by a variety of um, or very small organisms um, compared to the large ones you've just been um, listening to. Um, uh, so, and they vary in shape and size from, oh, I'm not sure this is working, anyway, up there, you can see uh, an influenza virus um, or some sort of visualization of one, uh, which is a very small um, thing indeed, small organism indeed, and there, uh, up there, in, in looking rather pretty in blue, is um, a bacterium known as the pneumococcus, which causes pneumonia. And here, in fact, you see the malaria parasite um, sitting inside a human red blood cell, no nucleus, as you can see. <laughs> and um, so this is a, another um, organism responsible for one of the most important um, killers, uh, mainly of young children, and uh, which spends a considerable part of its um, lifespan within the red blood cell. And finally here, somewhat larger, um, is the filarial worm, which is also vectored by a mosquito, just like malaria. Um, so it's small enough to do that, but it's still um, quite large, particularly in comparison with the influenza virus, for example. Now what I'd like you to do is visualize or replace all of these wonderful or not so wonderful um, bugs uh, with this little cartoon where to visualize the bug as having in possession a wardrobe from which it has to pick an outfit in order to do its business, which is not always to kill, but essentially what the bug lives to do is to infect humans. Or, well, I'm showing this humans, of course, the bugs of um, all kinds of um, other um, organisms. Every organism has its own set of bugs. But um, I wish this point was working. But anyway, um, what, you ha what I'm trying to show here is the whole process, the sort of life history of a bug which begins with infecting someone who is, is, no, is susceptible to not, not immune to that bug. And then you have a state where the person is infected. So that's where our little dressed up creatures are residing. They've happily, they've managed to enter this person. They are multiplying within that person. And their ultimate job really is to spread from that person to an yet another susceptible individual. Meanwhile, this person typically will recover, and when they recover, they will have, often, immunity to the bug. And what we try and achieve through vaccination, the whole rationale of vaccination, is to deliver someone from a state of being susceptible to infection to being recovered and immune, but circumventing that state whereby they're infected by a pathogen, a bug, which can cause disease, and even death. So how do we do that? How do we achieve this? Well, one thing you can do is to take the bug and kill it, shove it in a syringe, shove it in someone's arm, and what you're doing then is exposing that person to the bug, but you've killed the bug, so the bug can't really do any harm, but the person who's been injected um, or vaccinated in this uh, fashion is able to mount immunity to the pathogen. You don't have to kill the bug, you can simply attenuate it, you can weaken it so that it's no longer as harmful it would, as it would have been in its natural state. And then you can take the weakened version of, of the bug and shove it in a syringe and vaccinate. So that's another way of vaccinating. You don't even have to do that. What you can do, and new generation vaccines are often based on this principle, is to strip a bug of its clothes, of the outfit that I've mentioned, um, asked you to visualize earlier. If you just take the bits and pieces of the wardrobe, 
again put them in a syringe and in, in, uh, inject individuals, you can induce immunity to the pathogen, which kind of gives you an idea of what these articles of clothing are actually standing in for. What they are, are what the immune system sees. So when you become infected with a bug, a virus, like influenza or measles, uh, or indeed a malaria parasite, what the immune system sees and reacts to and later recognizes is not the whole bug, but just those bits of its outfit that are on display, um, which the immune system can recognize and make um, appropriate responses to that will protect you from further infection or at least from further disease. So, what do infectious disease agents have in their wardrobes? You, within this analogy, you can use this analogy to understand why certain diseases, like measles, um, are ones for which we have very good vaccines, while others, like influenza, we struggle to, to make good vaccines against. Effectively, within this analogy, measles has a very basic very limited wardrobe. You could say it has a very measly wardrobe. <laughs> and when you take the, the elements of this measly wardrobe and put it in a syringe, as I tried to show there, it's got a bit um, <laughs> spooky and ghostly, but in that ghostly syringe are all those bits of the measles virus's wardrobe, um, and then you inject someone, you can vaccinate, you can immunize them for the rest of their lives. So they become immune to measles for the rest of their lives, which is exactly what happens when you have natural, uh, when you're naturally infected with measles. You develop lifelong immunity to measles. And that's why you can make a vaccine just by mimicking that process. Influenza, by contrast, has a wardrobe that is highly diverse, by which I mean that the bits and pieces that are recognized by the immune system have the capability of mutating and changing to something different. Now that makes it very difficult to make a vaccine that will protect you against all strains of influenza. For example, even if you just focus on the hats, you, as you can see, it's kind of difficult to pack this many hats into one syringe that will then protect you, give you lifelong immunity to influenza. But we do have vaccines for influenza. I'm sure many of you have been asked to get them, take them. Many of you perhaps have um, submitted to that request. So how is that possible? Well, the reason that's possible is because influenza doesn't use its wardrobe all at once. What happens, which is what I've tried to show you up there, and if I had a point to be able to explain a little bit better, is that influenza essentially goes from season to season, changing its outfit. So first you get all the viruses appearing in a green outfit, then a few years down the line, they mutate, and then all the viruses appear in a purple outfit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what that means is that while it's impossible to fit all the hats into one syringe, we can actually protect against the flu that is currently circulating by choosing the appropriate hat. Just to see, what is it wearing now? Okay, purple hat, let's make a vaccine with the purple hats in it, and that's what we do. And then every three years we go, oh, it's changed to a green hat. Let's go and make a vaccine against the green hat. And this is where we're at now. So some years ago, um, about 10 years to be precise, we asked the question, is that really what influenza's wardrobe looks like? And the reason we asked that question is because this business of switching from the green outfit to the purple outfit to the red outfit to the white and to the blue, as shown here, which is what we know influenza does, is kind of difficult to explain if they do have this diverse wardrobe from which they can pick any outfit. I mean, a virus doesn't have a brain, so the idea that the whole virus population could actually coordinate somehow and say, hey, okay, we've done the green thing, let's now move on to do the purple thing, and then, oh, we've done the purple thing now, let's do the red thing. It just doesn't quite make sense. So we asked the question, 
what if instead influenza has a more limited, had a more limited wardrobe? And when I say ask the question, what we did is we set up an evolutionary model, so we wrote down equations reflecting that assumption. So we, a set of equations shown here, which are obviously not going to go into, oh, a pointer. I have a pointer. So these equations here essentially encapsulate just a particular principle that we know to be true of um, immune responses against influenza and indeed many other pathogens. That if the immune response recognizes, um, let's say an individual has been infected by the green type, an influenza strain wearing a green outfit, the immune responses, the defenses in place, will recognize and destroy anything wearing either a green hat, a green top, a green skirt, or green shoes. Because, of course, all they need to do in order to recognize the bug is to focus on any particular aspect of its outfit. So what that means is that once you have an epidemic of, let's say, the green type of influenza, while what you'd expect really to happen in the next generation is that you'd get this emergence of a whole kind of soup of different um, of viruses dressed in different outfits. Most of these will have something in common with that original green outfit. So, and there'll be very few like this. Oops, even this has stopped running. There must be something, me, me and pointers. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there in that. Uh, lower right-hand corner is, uh, is a virus dressed in an entirely white outfit. Now, that virus is not going to be rec recognized by um, individuals who've been previously infected by the green virus, but the rest of them all have something in common, and they will, therefore, be um, unable to succeed. And in, so what will happen in the next epidemic is that only those viruses... Um, who are wearing something that had nothing in common with the previous epidemic will get to uh, cause an infection. And that's how you get this sort of succession of different outfits, which is, um, characterizes the epidemiology of influenza. Why is this important? Well, obviously for us, it's fun. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> that's, why we, um, that's what we're paid to do. But in practical terms, it has very important implications. It means that instead of the vaccine being updated every three or four years, we can make a vaccine focusing on those bits of the wardrobe that are limited in variability, and that vaccine will not need updating. And I'm happy to announce that recently, through the efforts of my excellent research group, particularly Dr. Craig Thompson, um, we have actually found such an element of influenza's wardrobe. It's um, a region of um, the virus, which is shown there in the, the red and uh, the yellow unicorny horn sticking out. And that is on a molecule called um, a hemagglutinin, which is what's shown up there sticking out of the surface of the virus, these little blobs. Um, we've named this um, region, this epitope, as we call it, Oreo, after a rabbit I had, who sadly is no longer with us. Um, we have just recently published this paper showing that these um, elements, the wardrobe, actually do exist, because this theory, when it came out more than 10 years ago, was met with a, a lot of resistance um, from the influenza community. We filed a patent application to commercialize this, and we think we're just about all set to make a vaccine which will protect against all strains of influenza such that however it's dressed, it will have nowhere to go. Thank you very much. <laughs>